As I eat my way through the island, I realize that I'm actually experiencing the history of human movement through food. The stories of people moving across continents and oceans sits close to my heart, especially since my own parents were immigrants from rural Bangladesh to the UK some 40 odd years ago. It is from my immigrant parents that I had learned the power of food. From my father, who arrived in 1970s London, working in restaurants, cooking up and serving Bangladeshi cuisine. From him, I learnt the importance of treating everyone with dignity. And from my mother, who had moved to London that was as foreign to her as she was to her new neighbours. She would invite them to our family table, always squeezing in an extra seat for a new friend, feeding them to their full with her glorious homemade food, teaching them how to eat elegantly with their hands as we do in our Bangladeshi culture. And they in turn would share their British cuisine. It is my mother who has taught me that the perfect place to understand and get to know another human being is at the dinner table. One thing that I've discovered is that the food in Singapore that is so incredibly varied has been crafted by so many different hands. If we look closely, every bowl or plate is a portal to the past even beyond the borders of this red dot. It all serves as a reminder of how intertwined our human histories and ancestors truly were. I have loved even more how food can bring people who are continents apart closer together. It's just so nice to feel like my mom's kind of close to me, just <laughs> weirdly through this sardine puff pastry. The curry puff, which is similar to the sardine puff, is a popular snack in both Singapore and Malaysia. It has a filling with chicken, potato and egg encased in a deeply Moorish pastry. While its exact origins are unknown, the puff is thought to have been inspired by British pastries and Portuguese empanadas during colonial times and by samosas brought into the region by Indian settlers. the perfect breakfast, samosas and tea. Pastry is delicious. Okay, I've just had a bite. Well, I'm gonna have another. The filling is really spicy. Absolutely delicious. 
the humble samosa naturally led me to look deeper into the history of Singaporean Indians, which I've learnt is the umbrella phrase to include various people with South Asian roots, including Tamils, who make up the majority, Indians, Bangladeshis and other smaller and equally important groups. For centuries, the various South Asian communities in Singapore have lended their extraordinary spices and cooking techniques to Singapore's food culture beyond the humble samosa, including the tantalizing and fragrant biryani. And how could we resist this essential party dish? It was Deepavali after all, the festival of lights. Do not be fooled by the fact that this is a one-pot dish. It is as complex to make as it is in flavours. I have first-hand experience with my own Bangladeshi mother of frying the rice and ghee, marinating the meats in yoghurt and spices for several hours and layering all of these elements with crispy fried onions like a lasagna before slow cooking it in a sealed pot. I've been craving this so much. History reveals that it was the Mughal Empire who had introduced biryani to South Asia and India. Even the name biryani evolved from the Persian birinj biryan, which literally means to fry before cooking. Then, by the influence of different regional palates across India, the biryani evolved. Later in the 19th century, as British colonisation led to the development of a newly established trading port in Singapore, waves of Indian migrants were sent to the island, along with their cuisine. I find it incredible that whenever I'll eat biryani from now on, I'll think about how far it has come and all the hands it has passed through, from Persia to India and now also in Singapore. To touch the heart is the literal translation of dim sum from Chinese. These are dumplings, usually made from rice flour and are filled with incredible things, both savoury and sweet. They are traditionally steamed and served in bamboo baskets, originally enjoyed as a snack, but over the centuries they have evolved as a complete meal. Singapore is not the first place that I have come across dim sum. I have many warm memories of venturing out to London's Chinatown and seeking out dim sum hotspots during my university student days. But it is in Singapore where I have really appreciated the history of these individually handcrafted little pieces of art that take us to ancient China, as far back as the 10th century, where dim sum was enjoyed by the wealthy and the royals. Later in the 13th century, as traders and merchants used the Silk Road that connected China to Europe, the Middle East and Africa, they would frequently find respite in the multiple tea houses along the way. They were served dim sum with fragrant Chinese teas as yamcha or brunch. I like to imagine that they not only did business over these delicious bites, but had a chance to get to know each other and share their stories from their own lands. Dim sum is enjoyed through all of China with many regional differences, but it is thought that the actual origin of these edible gems may have been from southern China, namely from the Guangdong province. From here, the Cantonese style of dim sum spread further outwards, including to Hong Kong. By the time of British rule in the 19th century, migrant waves from southern China occurred to build the newly established trading ports in Singapore. They had braced the dangerous journey across the seas before reaching Singapore, in search of a better life from the more turbulent times in China. History has revealed that the Cantonese had developed the first few restaurants in Singapore over time, where many dishes were served, including beautiful dim sum. I don't think there's anything more joyful than to enjoy good food with good conversation. And I have had many joys from sitting with new and old friends, family members and my husband while sharing dim sum. Our hands, they'll glide gently across the table as we chat and laugh and they will gesture to one another to take the last odd numbered piece.
Each of these joys have left an impression on my heart, and then by some magical process, they have become part of my favorite memories in life. It is fitting then to me that the literal translation of dim sum to English is to touch the heart. In the 14th century, as Islam spread to Southeast Asia, Singapore and the surrounding regions had a rich history of kingdoms, communities and royal sultans who shaped and upheld the indigenous cultures and way of life. When the British controlled the trading port in the 19th century, a further influx of people migrated to Singapore from the surrounding regions of present-day Malaysia and Indonesia. Collectively, this population were called the Malays, and they were and still are deeply connected to one another by their culture, religion and food. I'm not sure when rendang exactly came to Singapore, but I think of it as a sort of native and ancient dish to the region of the Malaysian Peninsula and Indonesian archipelago. There are reports that the Minangkabau people, who are native to West Sumatra of Indonesia, developed the rendang as a means to preserve food for their expeditions. As part of their culture, they travelled far and wide across the region, including to Singapore, taking their cooking methods and dishes with them. Rendang itself describes more the cooking process that slowly braises meat in rich coconut milk and spices until the meat becomes fork and finger tender. The entire process can take several hours after multiple steps, but if you've followed the recipe properly and patiently, the end result is always a rewarding one. I don't think I'll ever have rendang again without thinking about the Minangkabau people, especially their commitment to traveling, immersing themselves in new experiences and gaining knowledge from unfamiliar lands. I feel there is so much in their philosophy that applies to me today, of practicing patience, wisdom and persistence more. And in many ways, I feel their culture and way of life seeps into their food, because it requires a patient and experienced hand to make the perfect rendang. And isn't that what life teaches us in the end? That good things always come to those who wait. The Indian, Chinese and Malays make up the majority of Singapore's population and there are many other cultures and ethnicities too who have helped shape Singapore's incredible food scene and I hope to share more of their food and their cultures in future videos too, including Peranakan Indians and Peranakan Chinese. For example, their beautiful adaptation of Kui. Peranakan settlers in the Malay archipelago had adapted some of these snacks that eventually became a part of the Singaporean food culture. Kui lapis is one beautiful example where each rainbow layer is made with rice and tapioca flour, coconut milk and sugar. I've been told by the locals here that this is a childhood favourite in Singapore and they would just peel off the layers when they were kids and just enjoy these as is mm. it's subtly sweet there's a little bit of a, a bit of a jelly texture and i like it i mean the rolling it up mm. good right yeah stories of people moving across continents and oceans sits close to my heart, especially since my own parents were immigrants from rural Bangladesh to the UK some 40 odd years ago. It is from my immigrant parents that I had learned the power of food, how it can bring people together at the dinner table, our families and friends, lovers and acquaintances, but also strangers where we can learn and get to know each other better. The last few months of exploring, resting and eating various foods in Singapore have helped me to think of the island as like a dining table, serving all of the world's various delicious dishes 
an island that is the perfect place to get to know one another better and where everyone has a place and seat, just like at my mother's table.